today, uh, there were a number of articles, again, in Barry Weiss's Substack. So I, I highly recommend barryweiss.substack.com. Barry is spelled B-A-R-I, Weiss, W-E-I-S-S, dot substack, dot com. Uh, her articles are all good, interesting, even when you disagree with them. She's a good writer, and, and she brings out interesting ideas. And today she's focused on the uh, prevalence, the prevalence of wokeism among, uh, in, in medicine, among doctors, researchers, medical schools, medical students, the material taught to medical students. And it is truly alarming to think that your doctor is now inspired, motivated, influenced by these ideas, and then it might affect your treatment, depending on your skin color, that your treatment, the priority of the treatment, the nature of your treatment, the attitude of the doctor might now be affected by your skin color. Not by, you know, just by color, skin. The racism now is the standard, not just being taught in education, but being taught in medical schools and being expected in terms of behavior from young and older doctors, and that it's also affecting the kind of medical research that is being done and what is being published in terms of medical research. Now, all of this, uh, I think, kind of uh, one of the most shocking examples of what is being taught is, um, this was published on, again, on Barry Weiss's website today. Um, she, uh, she published a uh, some text, but she published a recording of a lecture given by a, I don't know, psych uh, psychiatrist and psychoanalyst by the name of Aruna Kilanani called The Psychopathetic Problem of the White Mind. The Psychopathetic Problem of the White Mind. Now, this wasn't given at some obscure university in some obscure, I don't know, gender studies or racial, critical racial theory class. No, this was given at Yale School of Medicine in the Department of Child Studies, Child Studies Center. And it was given full credit to medical students. The psycho pathic problem of the white mind. Now imagine just to place white with black or any other color and maybe you can see the beginnings of a problem. As soon as you start categorizing people by race, as soon as you identify a mind of a racial group, in my view, you are a racist. You are practicing racism. But once you get into the content of the speech, it really gets bizarre. Now, I'll get to the content in a second, but here's, here's some of what was said were the learning objectives. Now, let me just tell you who the target audience is. The target audience for the speech are trainees in so child psychiatry, psychology and social work, faculty clinicians and scientists trainees in child psychiatry. The learning objectives. At the conclusion of this activity, participants would be able to, be able to, quote, set up white people's absence of empathy towards black rage as a problem. That sounds racist. Replace white and black, flip them. Understand how racism is part of the mind, the white mind, that white mind that arose during colonialism with a series of lies around violence. So racism is part of the white mind. You have no choice about it. Third objective, understand how white people are psychologically dependent 
on black rage. God, I guess I'm white. I mean, I've never thought of myself as a white person. It's not a category I would ever put myself in. But I guess if I look at my skin, it's kind of whitish, pinkish, whitish. So I am psychologically dependent on black rage. I didn't know this. This is a revelation to me. But this is what is being taught. That a whole group, a collective, is dependent psychologically on another group, on the other group's rage. What about blacks who don't have rage? I don't know. That's too complicated a question. That would imply there's such a thing as individuals, and God forbid we do that. Here's some quotes from the talk. It's six minutes, 45 seconds, and I won't give you all the timestamps. Quote, this is the cost of talking to white people at all. The cost of your own life as they suck you dry. There are no good apples out there. White people make my blood boil. I, for one, am offended, even though I don't consider myself white, but I guess she considers me white. My, my existence, my very presence, makes her blood boil. Well, I feel sorry for her. But defining people based on their race, based on the color of their skin, based on immutable characteristics is racism. And this is disgusting. There are no good apples there. There are no good individuals. They're, they're white, therefore they're not good. Quote, I had fantasies of unloading a revolver into the head of any white person that got in my way, burying their body and wiping my bloody hands as I walked away re relatively guiltless with a bounce in my step like I did the world a fucking favor. Ooh, I said the F word. Somebody owes me like 50 bucks, I think. Can you believe this stuff? This is a lecture at Yale. Quote, white people are out of their minds. And they have been for a long time. Quote, we are now in a psychological predicament because white people feel that we are bullying them when we bring up race. I don't think you're bullying us when you bring up race. They feel that we should be thanking them for all they have done for us. They are confused, and so are we. We keep forgetting that directly talking about race is a waste of our breath. We are asking a demented, violent predator who thinks that they are a saint or a superhero to accept responsibility. It ain't going to happen. They have five holes in their brain. It's like banging your head against a brick wall. It's just like sort of not a good idea. Don't even talk to white people because they're so beyond it. They're so, what is it? Confused. Well, right? They're so demented. And of course, they're a violent predator that there's no point in talking to them. And finally, we need to remember that directly talking about race to white people is useless because they are the wrong level of conversation. Addressing racism assumes that white people can see and process what we are talking about. They can't. That's why they sound demented. They don't even know they have a mask on. White people think it's their actual face. We need to get to know the mask, unquote. So she knows me better than I do. Reason cannot penetrate white people, assuming they're arguing from the perspective of reason. There's no conversation to be had. Now, what is the only means of change once you give up on talking, on conversation, 
on conviction, on reason, on discussion? What is all that it's left? How does one deal? How does one deal with a demented, violent predator when there's no point in talking to them? Well, the only thing left to them is force. The only thing left to them is force. And that's what they're setting up. The systemic racism. There's nobody to talk to. They're too demented to know that they are racists. We got to put them in camps. We got to, we got to, we got to, we got to use brute force. We got to use violence against them. It's the only way we can assert ourselves. We got to take their stuff. We got to put them in their place. Now, I don't think that's the way it's going to play out. I don't think that's the way it's going to play out at all. But this is what she's advocating. Now, again, now Barry Weiss actually says in the article, she says, I thought this might be a, a scam, like somebody put this up as a, as, a, as a pretend. But no, I mean, you can go to this woman's um, Twitter feed. She's proud of this talk. Yale, in its wisdom, decided not to make this talk public. And it's behind some firewall. Only students can access it, I guess. Um, but this woman is, is arguing that it should be made public. She wants it public. And if you look at her Twitter feed, you can see that this is real. This stuff is real. It's, um, this was not given by some wacky activists in some, I don't know, commune in some weird place. This was given to medical students at the Yale School of Medicine, one of the best schools of medicine probably in the world. This is what they're being taught. Elsewhere from Barry Weiss comes, whoops, where is this? Sorry, too many windows, there it is. Comes the story of a, a group of doctors, very similar to the groups of teachers that we talked about um, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, best friend, Hank, thank you for uh, paying up for, you promised that if I said the F word, you would pay up, and he's paid up, so good for him. No super chat questions. We've gone 21 minutes and not a single question, I don't think. Oh, one. Ryan asked a question. Sorry. Ryan asked a question. One super chat question. That's a record. You guys are questioned out or you're broke. Well, at least, at least best friend Hank is not broke. We know that. At least not yet. So you remember when we talked about the schools, Barry Weiss described um, these uh, groups of parents who would meet anonymously through Zoom to discuss the problems at their school and discuss their objections. But they wouldn't go public because they were afraid. And they did it in ways that nobody would know who they were. And they, when they interviewed with Barry Weiss, they wouldn't give their names because they didn't want to know that they were objecting to what the school was doing because they were afraid. Well, it turns out the same thing is happening with doctors. There are groups of doctors, at least there's one group of doctors, that meet regularly on Zoom to support each other with regard to what they see as the influence of world culture at their universities, at their hospitals, in their practices. Now, just to be clear, this is not some group of Texas, I don't know, conservative physicians. These are what you would consider leftists. They are voters of the Democratic Party. They tend to be, they consider themselves progressive. They are um, part, of, part of what would broadly be termed the left. But they are horrified, horrified by what is going on 
in the world, in their world right now. And they feel like they need a support group to handle it. So they tell stories of doctors who've been reported to their departments for criticizing residents for being late. And the resident who was late then complains that they think it was an act of terrorism. Sorry, terrorism. I don't know where terrorism came in. Um, that they think it was an act of racism. That being told you're late is racism. Maybe because the person who was late was a minority and um, just because they were criticized. It must be because of their race. Doctors have stopped giving feedback to trainees, honest feedback, for fear of retaliation. Because they're worried. They say the wrong thing to the wrong person of the wrong race, they will be hammered by their bosses. God, I don't think, I don't think my dad would have ever, my dad was a, is a doctor and w w taught at a medical, medical school, was known, known among his students for the harsh criticism. He's considered the toughest teacher in the medical school. Uh, he would nail these, in, in these trainees. Um, and yet now, you can't. You, you, have to, you have to be careful what you say. Some of these doctors say that there's a purge underway. I'm quoting from the article by Barry, by, uh, not, it's not by Barry Weiss, it's in Barry Weiss Substack. It's by, hmm, Jesse Singal. No, it's not Jesse Singal. What am I talking about? Um, it's Katie, Katie something. I don't know why they don't put the family name. Katie Herzog. This is by Katie Herzog. So there's a purge underway in the world of medicine based on ideas of critical race theory, based on ideas of, uh, uh, you know, wokish ideas. Now think about this. What this means is doctors are not going to get as good a training as they could get because their teachers are afraid to give them the kind of feedback that would make them good doctors. This is true certainly of minority students, but it's probably true of everybody because what happens is it's not like the teacher says, well, I'm not going to give harsh criticism. To minorities, what they typically say is I'm just not going to give harsh criticism. That way it solves the problem. I don't give the criticism. Imagine a generation of doctors who was never criticized, who was never told that they were late. What kind of doctors are they going to be? Imagine a generation of doctors more concerned about their hurt feelings by being criticized or by being criticized for being late. More interested in their hurt feelings than in whether they know the topic, whether they can treat the patient. What's the quality of healthcare gonna be when this is what drives doctors? when this is their motivation. It's scary, guys. It's scary to think that in the future, doctors are going to be more interested in their emotions than in facts, in your skin color, than in what disease you might have in whether they are towing the party line, whether they are politically correct, or whether they are doing good diagnosis and good work.
I'm quoting one of the doctors who said, people are, people are afraid to speak honestly. This is, a, a, this is an immigrant from the USSR. It's like back to the USSR, where you would only speak to ones you trust. If they're, right. When a doctor does speak up against some of these woke behaviors, the reaction is savage. You better be tenured and you better have thick, thick skin, he says. This affects even research. <laughs> this even affects research. There's a, publish, uh, a study published last year in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, the study was covered all over the news, and the headlines were, quote, black newborns more likely to die when looked after by white doctors. Another headline, the lack of black doctors is killing black babies, or black babies more likely to survive when cared for by black doctors. Wow, you might say. This means that racism works. That segregating people by race might be good for them. But it turns out that despite these amazing headlines, the study was dramatically flawed, methodologically poor. According to many doctors, the conclusions do not come out of the actual data, that it was, it's amateurish, and that there is a large number of doctors who think this paper is basically worthless. Right. Nobody will speak up against it, or very few people will speak up against it. Nobody has retracted the paper, even though the, 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 the research is flawed, it's published. Other research that supports these kind of conclusions is published. We'll see what happens to articles that don't support these kind of conclusions. So for example, Norman Wang, possibly Asian, but you know, I, I, it shouldn't and doesn't matter. Norman Wang, uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, a P University of Pittsburgh cardiologist were, uh, published a paper in the Journal of the American Heart Association. The paper analyzed uh, and criticized diversity initiatives in cardiology. He looked at 50 years of data and he argued that affirmative action and other diversity initiatives failed to meaningfully increase the percentage of blacks and Hispanic clinicians in this field or to improve patient outcomes. And it was time to stop, stop pretending that by hiring and promoting clinicians based on their race, anything good was happening. So he criticized the idea of long-term academic solutions and excellence should not be sacrificed, or not criticized, he promoted the idea, should not be sacrificed for short-term demographic optics. optics. Ultimately, all who aspire to a profession in medicine and cardiology must be assessed as individuals on the basis of their personal merits, not their racial or ethnical, ethnic identities. Now, I like Norman Wang. I've never met him, but just based on that sentence, I like him. What was the response? Well, Sharon Hayes, a cardiologist at Mayo Clinic, implored colleagues to rise up. The fact that this is published in our journal, the Journal of Cardiology, both, should both enrage and activate all of us. She added the hashtag retract racists. It's racist to say that affirmative action hasn't worked. It's racist to say doctors should be treated as individuals, should be promoted based on individual merit, should be hired based on individual ability. That 
she says, is racist. The editor, the editor of the journal, Journal of American Heart Association, I think my father actually is published in that journal, issued an apology. And the journal retracted the work over Wang's objections. There was no, no suggestion of error in the paper. No suggestion there was anything wrong with the paper. Just that publishing it supposedly was anti-ethical to his and his journal's values. Now, this is a journal that never retracts papers unless data is being shown to be falsified or, or, or wrong or there's real problems empirically or otherwise with the paper itself. The American Heart Association, which I know my father's part of, which publishes the journal, issued a statement denouncing Wang's paper and promising an investigation. So Wang is now suing both the AHA and the University of Pittsburgh for defamation. Good for him. I hope he wins. And this is nuts. Calling somebody a racist because he's advocating for individualism. He's advocating for what made the West the West, what made America America, what made the profession of medicine even possible. The idea of individualism, the idea of ability, the idea of merit. Now that's not the only journal. Here's one more. The Journal of the American Medical Association released a podcast that was hosted by its deputy journal, or then deputy journal. And in this podcast, he said things like, personally, personally, I think taking racism out of the conversation will help. Many of us are offended by the concept that we are racists. Basically saying what I'm saying. Just the fact that I'm white doesn't make me a racist. Massive uproar. 9,000 signatures in a petition. He gets removed as deputy journal editor. The editor gets kicked out. They apologize, saying that they apologize for the inaccurate, offensive, hurtful, and inconsistent presentation that's has nothing to do with the standards of the journal. This is just... Now, the good news here is that this has led to some backlash. So there are some sane people within these associations. And uh, that, uh, you know, uh, some of these doctors wrote that there is a general feeling that the firing of the editors involved in the podcast was perhaps, perhaps... <laughs> Precipitous, precipitous, possibly a blot on free speech and also possibly an example of reverse discrimination. Possibly, possibly, possibly. Grow some balls. And this is why they win. This is why the woke people win. They have balls. They don't mind saying. That they think they're in the right. Oh, Jesus. Oh, okay. John Wayne, you had me, you had me worried there for a minute in the chat. Um, it worked. Whatever effect you were trying to create, it worked. The left, and this is true in economics, this is true in every field. The left has the moral high ground. The left knows exactly what it wants. The left says, fire them. They're bad. They're racist. They're evil. Get rid of them. The right says, the right, it should be the right. The better people say, well, we think you overdid it. You think you maybe exaggerated a little bit. It's possibly a blot. It's possibly an example of reversal. Let's not get too, I, we don't want to make any definitive statements. We certainly don't want to. 
get into a moral argument with you. The left understands, and I've said this about EOC, and I've said this about the left broadly, they understand the power of ethics. They understand the power of morality. They understand the power of altruism. They understand the power that altruism has on people, and therefore if they present themselves as victims, the power that that has, if they present whatever remedy they have as helping the victims, helping the poor, helping the oppressed, helping the minorities, the power, the moral power that that has, and they don't fear using that moral authority that they think they have. And this is why the better people cannot win, cannot win, unless we embrace a morality, a morality of individualism, a morality that advocates for something and that, that declares the critical race theorists, the wokest, they are the racists. They are the racists. They're the ones who should be embarrassed and ashamed of their positions, their views, their ideas. We should be declaring without any compromise that their ideas are evil. And this is not to deny racism exists. I've been saying this for a long time. I get, a, I get criticized on, 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 on the chat for this. But yes, there is racism against blacks and bum people in America. There's even anti-Semitism. And there are examples of it that these doctors present of, of certain tests and, you know, things that are truly racist that need to be eliminated. That needs to be eliminated. But you do that. You do that from the perspective of a philosophy of individualism, a, a, a morality of individualism. You do that with the moral high ground on your side as an individualist who is getting rid of all forms of racism, all forms of categorizing, categorizing people based on race. So beware of young doctors. Beware of doctors being trained today. Beware of the 9,000 doctors who wrote the petition to get the editors fired. What they are promoting, there's more stories in this Barry Weiss article that I encourage you to read. What they're promoting is placing emotion, the emotion of the minority student, the emotion of the minority doctor, above the facts of reality, above proper treatment of healthcare. There's stories about young doctors who won't treat conservatives, who won't treat people who they think they disagree with. That they as doctors should tell their patients what is right and what is wrong, not just in medicine, but in other areas of life. And this is being pushed by a, 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 a diversity industry that pushes the stuff we talked about you know, white fragility and the, the scam of white fragility and everything else. Um, you've got now, you got now, for example, a, a group called White Coats for Black Lives, formed by medical students in 2014. 75 chapters all over the United States in medical schools. They publish a racial justice report card that grades medical schools, not based on the quality of providing medical education, but on their racial, critical race theory, justice perspective. And they make specific demands of institutions. For example, one of the demands is that hospitals and medical schools not work with local law enforcement. Now imagine what would happen if emergency rooms stopped working with police. It would be chaos. It would be a disaster for everybody involved. And on what 
basis would you do that? So, sorry, just uh, doing something here. Well, I mean, we can hope that everybody embraces the morality of individualism, we, we, that, but that's essentially what we're fighting for. The essential fight is a fight over the morality of individualism. That's what the world rejects, and that's what we stand for. All right, um, let's see if there's anything else here. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you're seeing young physicians applying anti-racist principles and choosing how they allocate their time and which patients they choose to work with. Uh, COVID-19 cases where doctors said, we'll treat the minorities first because this one guy says, I'm not going to treat that white guy. I'm going to treat the person of color instead because whatever happens to the white guy, he probably deserves it. Now, that's a direct consequence of the kind of education they're getting. So, racism, the leftist form of racism, it now dominates our culture. And it, it dominates the most important institutions within our culture. At the, at the cultural level, I don't, think it, I don't think it's filtered down to day-to-day -day stuff. But it, it has an influence on educational institutions. It now is having an influence on our doctors and our medical institutions. Clearly has impact in many of our political institutions. Now, I think there's going to be a backlash. And I think the backlash could be quite brutal. I don't think wokeism will ever become popular. I don't think wokeism will ever become the rule of the land. People will reject it. The question is what they reject it for. I think all this does is increase real, increase white racism, if you will. I think all this does is create resentment, create tribal warfare, create tribalism. Both sides are becoming more and more tribal, less and less rational. It's popular among certain elites. It's a tiny fraction of the population. It's not even most of the left. It's a fraction of the left, never mind a, a fraction of the entire population. But the majority will rebel against this. And when they do, it will be particularly ugly. And the clash of all these racist tribal forces is going to be a disaster. So I encourage you to go over and subscribe to Barry Weiss's um, Substack. Give us some financial support. I think she deserves it. And uh, this is one of the fights that we have to engage in. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist, 
Brilliant. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at yourownbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs> 